talk a different way in a second. But first of all, this is sort of a management topic, but it's it's about how management can actually support self-organizing team. And I want to share some of the trends that's going on, mainly in Sweden where I work, but in other countries as well, in how management can help. Because, you know, I see a lot of agile coaches, I work with agile coaches daily. Most of the agile coaches are, you know, they have funny t-shirts, they have funny hairdos, they are very trendy, we call them hipsters in Sweden. Uh, but I want to see more agile coaches that look like this. Because if we never get management to get this, it will never go beyond engineering. And if we never go beyond engineering in agile, we will never ever make the full potential out of this. So I'm going to give you some tools and some trends and some ideas on what's happening and how you can work with your management and so on to help them grasp this a bit more. Definitely. Um, as Ronick said, I've been working with quite a few companies. Uh, I set up the, the way Spotify is organized today. I have a scale from 30 to 35 employees. I think there are four or 500 worldwide now. I work with a small company called Dwing that you may have heard of. They were 80 when I started. We grew them to 350 in one year without losing productivity and so on and so on. And interesting part about this, I've been working with Agile in everything from poker online to companies building worker plants, micro plants worldwide. And we use Scrum for construction there. And some of the challenges are very, very similar, which is interesting. One is a fast business, one is a really slow business with huge projects, but you still have similar challenges. So I want to show you some of those. Also, I'm writing books on the subject, and uh, my books are pretty hard to find because I don't sell them, I don't market them. Uh, but I recently finalized one of my books about trying to reboot the Scrum Master because the Scrum Master is the single most uh, misunderstood role in agile communities today. So I'm going to share you a bit of uh, sort of why this is and why how we're trying to reboot this Scrum Master. And for those interested, please leave your email with Radek and I'll send you a link to download the book afterwards if you're interested. It's 160 pages of uh, uh, maybe putting you to sleep for Christmas. We'll see. So, okay, a brief geography lesson. Strong to be in Wuch. This is the place I usually spend my time in. This is Sweden, as you may know. And Sweden is pretty tall. And the part of Sweden is actually situated yeah, above the polar Arctic Circle. And uh, this is where I was born 45 years ago. Uh, and there are a few things to know about the Arctic Circle. First of all, it's not marked. So you can't follow a dashed line. But if you could, and you would move north of it, it would be pretty much dark 24 hours now, this time of year. And it's it's uh, sunshine 24 hours in six, seven months, which is weird. I have pictures of myself driving my car at 2 a.m. in the morning with my sunglasses because I had the sun in my eyes. Um, the thing is, there, there are some things to know about my upbringing that makes me, I think, a bit suited for working with transforming bigger organizations. Now, one thing, for instance, this is this is the big square of my hometown on a Friday evening. <laughs> you can really see stuff happening here, right? Uh, you can see our skyscraper. Uh, the business is booming. Um, top company unfortunately went bankrupt that no one removed the sign yet because we had no people to do that. And uh, pretty much uh, most of the city is divided in two halves by a stream of water. Uh, and uh, there, there was a public vote back in the 60s, 60s what to call the other side uh, of the place. And it was of course named the other side. So there are actually road signs that state, oh well, you're now going to the other side. Of course, I was born and raised in the premier side, as you might know. It feels a bit funny to stand on the stage. Can you guys see okay if I stand here? <coughs> Still see my wonderful pictures, right? So, this is my backyard. <laughs> you know, we're selling a lot of iron ore to China and other places now, so we have to dig out the place. So, 
some people have to move their houses. You know, you grow pretty patient when you do these things and when you live with these things. And just to show you the, the rate of my patience, I learned to type and write and read using one of these. I learned to calculate using one of these back then. And then we upgraded to this one. This one had like 33 programming steps, so I learned to code this way. So this was my first computer. Anyone recognize this? It's not British, it's, it's a ZX81. It had a 1K memory, 64 pixel plus. So this, this was one of the top games back then. You're starting to see the problem here, right? Patience, tons of patience. Uh, and it helps, it helps. This actually, this is a new game. Do you recognize this? It's Minecraft, wow. So, anyone plays Minecraft? At least someone does. Yeah, your son. So usually someone says, yeah, well, my sons play Minecraft. I would never play Minecraft. It's pretty fun to stand. You know, I do management training. I work with old guys and, and, and women in suits. And, and I tell them, you know, I'm a 45-year-old management consultant. I play 30 minutes of Minecraft every day to wind down. And they look at me funny. And then in the coffee break, they say, I do that too. <laughs> with my sons or daughters. And Minecraft is amazing, or, or it's a game that has captured sort of the imagination of a lot of people, tons of people actually, 40 million people have invested in this journey. And the interesting thing is about the Swedish company Muyen, who, who created Minecraft, is that they were the first company, at least in Sweden, that used Scrum in the business model. So they did something that was sort of that had production quality but was not feature complete. And they released an alpha release of Minecraft, which was production stable. So you could generate the world, you could explore the world, you could find a way to craft some things, but there was not a lot of things to see, there was not a lot of monsters, not a lot of challenges, not a lot of stuff to craft. But it was interesting enough and stable enough to have people invest money in this, you know, to to see what's coming next and be a part of influencing what's coming next. Uh, and this actually grew Minecraft beyond the very, very short lifespan uh, uh, a game has on the shelves. You know, some of the biggest game productions cost millions. They, we, we speak about 100, 200 million years to produce a game and you sell it for full price for two weeks and then it goes down in price on sale. And this sucks if you're a developer and you're part of those 100, 200 million years. And we ain't changed the game by producing a better release that was actually fully stable. And all of the companies that used to do Scrum the old way, they released stuff that was not working. But the idea is that you should release something that has production quality, but it's not teaching complete all the time. I know this is difficult, but as engineers, we can figure, figure this out. The problem is getting product management and top management to figure this out. So anyway, enough Minecraft. This is sort of what we're struggling with. This is sort of the pipeline of stuff that we need to deal with. And the bottleneck is always the skills and the capacity. How much people do we have and what do we know? And it's interesting, when I go to companies and I do an analysis, most people don't know in top management their capacity. They say, oh, we run like 10 projects. Okay, successfully? No, they're all late. Okay, so perhaps you're going beyond your capacity. And time, as you see, I marked it red here, because time, time is the resource. When I talk to developers, Time is the resource most developers and engineers say that they don't want to waste. It's the most precious time, the sort of resource they have. Don't you people hate when some of your management waste your time or you're working a weekend and suddenly you were, you were working on the wrong stuff? And your manager blames you. Why were you working on this stuff? Oh, hey, you told me to. No, I didn't. That guy, he's a project manager. He doesn't know anything. I'm the boss and so on. So time is really, really, really precious. So we have to figure out how to spend time in the best way and to have management 
support the same hockey powers than class. So the first is sort of to learn the distinction between push and pull. I guess most of you know the distinction between push and pull, but it's good to have some. You're also push is interesting. Push is the traditional way of doing product development. Push is basically, you know, we have a number of things to do. We have some people trying to manage the things to be done. Uh, sometimes we call them project managers. They plan stuff for us. They plan stuff for us to do. Uh, in the teams, they make fight for people, time. They call us resources from now on time. You know this. An interesting thing is that you can do this with Scrum. We call the work to be done backlogs. We call the angry people in the middle product donors, and we have teams. And we're doing sort of Scrum. That is a push system, so it's not efficient. The flip side of a push system is, of course, a pull system. Now, a pull system is different. It acts differently because in a pull system, we work as management to try to create a roadmap, a vision of things that need to be done, headlines that need to be made, deals that are up on it, priorities that we can use. As development teams, engineering teams, we pull stuff high-level stuff from this, and we start detailing with them, planning a forecast on how we will spend our time in advance. And this makes it more interesting, because the people, that is, engineers, that understand that the challenges of doing things are actually planning the sequence they will be made, instead of having project managers trying to figure out. I used to be a project manager. Uh, that was a hell of a job. Any project managers here today? Yeah, a few with a fix. My condolences. <laughs> no. Um, they're good project managers and, and uh, project managers that can learn. Uh, you're, you're here to learn, I guess. That's good. So, the idea here is for project managers not to plan how people should do the work, but actually to challenge the plan and say, have you thought about these things? Have you considered these risks? And so on. But you get a, a playing field where all of the engineers and engineering teams, scrum teams, if you so like, can actually show a forecast of how they will spend their time and their resources. And that's pretty interesting because suddenly planning and forecasting becomes a community thing not owned by a few. This is one of the keys in a pool system. So we still have deadlines in a pool system. We still have a forecast on what is coming and when. It's not, you know, working on what we want, whatever we want. It. It's following a plan. But we're constantly revising the idea of how it should be done, which is different. Also, this makes for a more stable forecast because a lot of people have produced it, not one person, meaning that it's stable, meaning that if someone gets on an extended sick leave, for instance, or your kids needs to training, a school or whatever, it can adapt more easily because more people are working with it. Anyhow, you see in this timeline, 100 times before, because you are you, you're at this as your prime interest, most of you, just move aside so you can see it. Um, the new thing that sort of come at the, the very end of this timeline is SAFE, Scale Agile Framework. And this was described in 2008 at first in a book by Dean Leffingwell named Agile Software Requirements. It, it's probably a book with the worst title ever because it's not really about requirements. I actually read it because I was looking for an interesting book for requirements and I couldn't find one. Sorry. And then I found this book, and it's about scaling and I thought, hey, this is interesting because it has a different shape. And this ended up being safe. And we're going to come back to safe and scale that in a few minutes. Just going to show you a few other things about my background in this. Why am I doing this? Well, you know, I, I merge, I, I have a master's degree in, in computer science, and I thought, you know, I thought my job was going to be like this. I thought we were going to build cool stuff, land things on the moon and whatever. I'm, I'm sort of a space nerd, I have to admit, and I'm, I'm a bit sad because I was born just after the moon landing, and we're still not putting any people in space. 
on other planets, and I think they will after I die. So, but anyhow, can at least you can play purple space for a little while. So this was my first job. This was not that exciting. You see the state of the art back then, 17 inch monitor, uh, CDs. We used to have these with music on. Some of you may remember that. Yeah, we have Spotify these days. Yeah, you know, yeah, I know. Um, and my first year basically was very alone. I was fixing bugs for the first year in someone else's code. Uh, he made a career, he became an architect, so he didn't write, have to write the code anymore. So he left all the goodies for us to fix. So the first thing I do as a change agent in companies today is to find these architects and then smoke them out. And usually I ask them, but why are you guys don't write code anymore? And they look at me and they say, we don't know either. This is the way it ended up. So uh, that's a problem there, right? We, we may, may need, that's a bit outside this topic, but we may need two types of architects in the future. One that actually, actually works with business, closely with business, to, to uh, show and, and reason why we need these technical investments to make these features and scale this product. And we need another type of architect who has the cred and the interest to actually work in agile things as a guy. But that's a different discussion. Maybe we'll come back to that later. All the meetings I had suck. All of the meetings in my first two jobs were basically, okay, this is the list of endless parts. This is the endless list of customers who are angry with us. So who should we try to serve first? I don't know. And I hope your meetings are better. Mine's not. Still, I was basically spending, you know, most of the time I was spending in my office. This is actually, I'm a photographer as well, so most of the pictures you will see are actually the pictures I've taken. So this was my actual office. I was waiting every day, you know, for the clock to turn five so I could go home and do something real with my life. That's horrible, right? You spend eight, ten, twelve hours on a job, you want to feel like this is contributing. Not, this is spending my time so I can go home. This is, by the way, before we have the policy introduced in the company that you are not allowed personal stuff on your office, meaning that the code hanger lab block and the picture have to be sort of. How many times like this a cola, not a beer? I'm sort, of, I'm sort of amazed by this place, by the way, it's, it's great. Uh, I never seen this chair. I I know two Polish words. Um, <laughs> Which one? <laughs> so so I know the word potelem, potelem, seat basically, and I know the word kombinować, and I can actually combine these, which is amazing. So I found a use for both my words. It, it doesn't help me when I try to get home in the evenings, but. <laughs> So, anyway, my office. Uh, I realized pretty early that we need some sort of mix. We need, we need actually, because Scrum was emerging in the early 2000s. I started working with Scrum 2001. I became Sweden's first Scrum trainer in 2006, which doesn't mean really crap. It means that I worked with some really skilled people, that's all. But yeah, you have to be careful so you don't end up becoming a Scrum Taliban or whatever. But the thing is, Everything was talking to engineers, and my sort of grasp of this was that engineers already got this. It has to move beyond the engineer. We have to have a collaboration, you know, between the dark side and the light side of a business, the business side and the engineering side. You figure out the rest of the evening which side is dark and light. Uh, I don't know myself. So I started working with lean organizations because. Uh, we used to be pretty bad, uh, pretty badass at Lean actually in, in uh, Sweden back then. We had Scania, it's still pretty good. We had Saab, you know, you remember Saab, the funny cars. Uh, we have all of the boring cars, they're pretty good at, at Lean as well. I started asking all of these people, how do you apply Lean to your organization? What's the most important tool? Because I didn't realize back then that the most important tool is here. But I asked, what tools do you use? They said, okay, we use one tool that is really powerful. It's visual planning. Visual what? It means put up all your plans. 
We should always do that. We have scrum boards. We have scrum boards with sticky notes all <coughs> along. Not just your monthly planning, your planning and forecasts for the upcoming years. If you can do that in Agile, oh, sure, it changes all the time. That's the difference. When you put it on the walls, it becomes everyone property. Everyone is suddenly really interested in updating it, making sure that it reflects the reality. You know the flip side, the, the, the opposite is having project managers, three people having the plan. I usually ask this when I come to new companies. I ask, where is the plan? And usually a project manager starts ruffling your laptop and saying it's in my Excel over here. That's where it resides. This is a community thing. So visual planning puts focus on problem solving. It shows where we have problems, where we have deviations. Uh, I sometimes say we move the, the prestige of saying that we're late or we're having problems or here's some trouble here. We move it from you know the individual having to say we have a problem to the board. And we can gather people around the board to solve the problem and it becomes really powerful when you have management looking at the board and saying how can we help you guys solve this problem what do you need do you need us to talk to the customers do you need us to delay this do you need to simplify the scope what do we need to solve it so it becomes again everybody's thing so let, let's briefly fly through this. I know if you know your Scrum and your Kanban. I find it very interesting with Scrum and Kanban that they're sort of suspicious to each other right now. You either do Scrum or you do Kanban, and you, you're either a Scrum trainer, which makes you suspect in certain uh, communities, and, or you do Kanban and you have retrospectives of Kanban, and it's become sort of Scrum bound or, or, or Kanban, whatever. And I find this just weird. I mean, there's a two types of things. First of all, Scrum is excellent for work that can be planned. So for instance, it doesn't have to be software. I used to Scrum when I remade my kitchen. So this is not my kitchen. <laughs> uh, I, I don't dare show you my kitchen because you would leave. But. So this is a kitchen. And then of course I, was, uh, I made a backlog, these are the stuff I need to to purchase the, these sort of things I need to make. I could make a high level yeah. priority, right? I want to make the sort of uh, fixing stuff first and the cleaning stuff later. And then I was stupid enough to publish my estimates on Facebook. And you know what happened on the sprint later. I had to update them, so I got all kinds of snarky comments from my friend who knows what I do for a living. So there's Scrum for you. And one interesting thing about Scrum is that in Scrum, they, they put all of the stuff that contains product development into a pot, but they boil the pot for some time. And out came three different roles that need to be separated to support product development in, in, in an efficient way. So we have three different roles, and we call them different things. And uh, let, let's look briefly at the roles, because they're interesting, and they're not that well implemented in a lot of the companies I work with. For instance, we have the team. A lot of people don't know that the team are not only responsible in Scrum for producing code and pr producing the product, developing the product, it's also they are responsible for actually changing the way we work. Looking at how we work, updating the procedures, so over time, all of the process gurus will be kicked out, and we will be left with teams that actually update the processes to make them more efficient. Right. So teams are there to explain the possibilities. You know, with this technology, we can do all of these things. As Google realized many years ago, innovation comes from teams, not from product management. Sorry, that's just the way it goes. If you have time to play with the technology, you come up with amazing things. Second row, uh, sorry, this is a trend. Have you heard about this? ALM teams, you know about this stuff. Agile lifecycle management teams. Uh, this sort of coincides with the DevOps theory. You have teams that support everything from, you know, finding out the, the, the needs, writing the stories, to deploying the code and maintaining it, supporting it. So we don't no longer support, uh, separate uh, development from deployment. And a lot of teams in Sweden at least are going in this direction. And it's very, very powerful. 
because we meet, we we skip one hand over. That's usually problematic. You know, when everyone has deployed something on Friday evening, you know how easy it is to try to find a developer who can come in Friday night and fix a bug in production. It's not the funniest thing to do. Second role is the Scrum Master. Being a Scrum Master currently sucks. Uh, why? Because Scrum Masters are usually reduced to being the sticky note expert. They come with all the colored sticky notes, right? And they do the planning. Sometimes they become project managers. Some only have yellow sticky notes. I'm trying to teach this guy some tricks. Um, so, and they're supposed to build high performing, efficient teams. Mm. Making efficient teams out of engineers. Someone once told me, a guy I coached, that it's, it's a bit like herding cats, right? I wouldn't say that, but the thing is, the Scrum Master is supposed to be the change agent of Scrum. This is the person who is supposed to drive the actual change in the company. All the Scrum Masters, 100% of the Scrum Masters I coach and work with, when I ask them, are you responsible for driving the change in the company, I say, Oh no, we don't know who do that. I'm here to plan for the team, and so on. So that's why we need to reboot the role, because I used to work with Ken Schleber back in the day when he was still working and drinking, as we say. And uh, this was the original idea with the Scrum Master, was that it was supposed to be the change. How many Scrum Masters do we have in tonight? No. <laughs> a couple. So at least one of you, Radek, is sort of responsible for changing things. How about you, sir? Are you responsible for driving the change in your panel? <laughs> <laughs> we have to change that. Otherwise, we can stop being Scrum Masters. We can call it something else. And then, of course, we have the product owners. Uh, product owner is not about writing requirements and setting priorities. Product ownership is actually about being responsible for the entire life cycle of your product and expressing that vision to everyone in the company. So it's fully clear when we're working late on a Friday evening and we have to change, the, the, sort, sort of decide between two things in engineering, it's always clear when and why. Yeah, we have to rewrite your job description, I know. It's a problem, it's an opportunity. So, Okay, let's let's go into the atoms of, of Agile here before we move to the big picture. So, for the atom of, of, of Scrum and Agile, I actually have to borrow some fractals. You know fractals, right? Uh, when I started programming for real, fractals became big. So we produced a lot of these pictures, and it's amazing. I used to do this. This is, you know, the old guy saying how it used to be with when computers were running on steam and stuff, but. It, it usually took a full night to render one of these pictures, and now I can do it in real time on my phone. It's pretty weird. This guy was responsible for making fractals popular. He's called Benley Mandelbrot, and he worked at IBM Labs as a researcher. And he used to pester all of his colleagues during lunchtime and coffee breaks by asking, so how far, how long is the British coastline? And finally, someone got angry with him and said, well, you go measure it. And you know, that was sort of what he was waiting for. So his reply was, so how long should my yardstick be? Because if I have a shorter yardstick, I can insert it into more detailed base. So it actually, I will get a bigger result. And this leads to all kinds of weirdness, like for instance, the dimension of the British coastline being 2.5. Uh, and, and these are things that are fairly complex. I know Radek will explain this later to you guys, but sticking with Agile now and leaving practical mathematics aside, it's interesting because we have the yardstick and scrum, as you know, and we call it the sprint. And this is essential because every sprint is similar. Every sprint has a start, a content, and an end. And we do pretty much the same thing over and over again. And the good thing about this is that we actually create a way of trying to hit the moving target. And secondly, controlling stress and pressure. Because we lock down the goals for a short period of time. We finish the goals, deploy them, 
and then we change. Meaning that we don't change every day. And I think this is something that some in the discussions between Scrum and Kanban we miss out of this because it's actually a task to sometimes to lock down the goals and work to a fixed goal for two weeks or something compared to having a continuous flow of stuff depending on the type of work. So the optimal thing is to combine Scrum and Kanban to, and use them depending on the type of work you do. So going to flow development, I said there was going to be, I promised there was going to be some caps. We're going to increase the cap density of the slides now dramatically. So what's wrong with this road? What's the problem? Maybe this is the way all roads work here. <laughs> Everybody else. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah <right there. laughs> it's an engineering engineering answer, yeah. It's 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 built over its capacity. Um, and the problem with building stuff over its capacity is that it, it looks like we're doing a lot of stuff, but we're not getting anywhere, right? We're not moving, really. And there's a problem here. The problem is that our curves look like this. So when we start over-utilizing people and resources, we end up doing less all the time. But it's not obvious. It is really not obvious. Most managers I talk to, they think this is a linear stuff. The more we have, the more consult. It's not true. Look at this. This is one of my favorite graphs ever. This is from... This is from a book by two guys named Wheelwright and Clark. They made a study in 1992 where they looked at, this is the number of parallel things you're trying to manage as, as an engineer, one to five. This is the total amount of value added time you bring to your organization, meaning that we can deal with one or two things in parallel, but as long as we, when we start doing three, four or five things in parallel, things go south fairly quickly. Now the problem here is that when you're on the right hand side, you're responsible for five different things that you're trying to juggle during your workday, it feels pretty good, right? And to your boss, it looks amazing. Wow, this guy or girl really knows how to spend their time being efficient. But in the end, we're not adding any value almost. Trick question for people who drive coffee instead of beer. Why does it seem slightly more efficient to deal with two things in parallel instead of one? <laughs> yeah, you're getting worse. You shift. Even worse, if 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 uh, if you get blocked during the first one, you can shift to the other one instead of waiting. Right. So that's a trick. So we like to do Kanban for unplanned work and work that is fairly well defined and you start to realize some of you i guess that we actually have both right we have a flow of work that is planned that needs to be iterated and, and researched and we have work that is pretty straightforward we don't really know always when it will appear so let's talk about interrupts for a second when you're interrupted by someone trying to block you from your work so i guess you know that kanban actually was inspired partially by Japanese manufacturing tradition, but also partially by Japanese managers visiting um, supermarkets in the US back in the 50s. And they were amazed by what they saw because they had a constant just-in-time flow of goods from the warehouse to the shelves. Never too much in the warehouse, never too little in shortage. And someone thought, or rather one person, who was named Taichi Ono. Oh no, it's an amazing name, right? Um, realized, what would happen if we had this in our plants, building cars? So they brought it to Japan, to Toyota, and created the Kanban system and the just-in-time system. And this is why Japanese manufacturers build cars now in half the time compared to the American counterparts because they left all of this creative thinking in the supermarkets. They never got to the factories. So this is where things go tricky 
because this is where we actually need to start thinking about the difference between lean production and lean product development. Now, most agile tools, as we know them, Scrum, XP, and so on, they address lean product development. This is where we have high degree of iteration. This is where we have high degree of variability, meaning that sometimes we can't estimate this stuff. We need to try and see where we end up. Whereas lean production addresses where we have low variability. This is where it starts to make sense, you know, to optimize in minutes, seconds. This is where we move the breaker closer so we don't need to go as far to catch printouts and so on. And Scrum is pretty much here. Kanban is pretty much here. This is why the combination is so uh, powerful. The problem is that if you use Kanban without thinking, you actually end up supporting the myth of the software factory. And this is again where the management problems come because most managers learn from trade school that software product development is predictable. And there was this guy, I don't know if you heard about him, Gerda, who in the 50s ruined everything for us because he proved mathematically that you can never write a computer program and ensure that it's perfectly correct. So sometimes we have to try and we have to iterate, and that spoils things. And this is why it's sometimes an uphill battle, because some people learn from school already that this should be predicted if we just get better engineers. So production, when it's really simple stuff that you can put together, can be optimized. Innovation, that's different. We need time to think. We need space. We need skills. And the tricky part about product development is that it actually contains both. It contains both, and we need to know when to apply both. So, how do we do this in practice? Well, this is one way of doing it. We can have a Kanban flow, part of the sprint, uh, and we can have Scrum, the plan flow, part of the sprint, that we just adjust the amount of them depending on how the work. So we need to do some kind of requirements analysis up front first to see if just briefly these are typically production stuff, this is routine stuff. This we need to think about and make sort of design decisions. It's, this needs to iterate. And this is again where one of the flaws of Scrum become apparent. Because Scrum says that business owners should prioritize everything, right? Here's the problem. I, I never found a business owner, a product owner, who knew how to correctly uh, prioritize non-functional requirements, scalability, security, you know these things. So we need to upgrade the server so you can do that next year. We don't have time for that now, we need new business features. It's really, really hard. So my suggestion that I started working with a few years ago was to actually reduce the amount of prioritizable time for product management and leaving time for engineering to do the work properly. You see? And I actually find a met found a metaphor that was working. You know, when you hire someone to tile your bathroom or rebuild your bathroom, uh, there's there's this moment in time where you put the productive sheets in, uh, sorry, the protective sheets, the protective layer to, to uh, prohibit your moisture, your your water to travel into the walls. In Scrum, we say you can prioritize everything, meaning, oh, this moisture protection layer, that looks boring. You can tile it first, so it looks good, right? And we can add this stuff later, meaning that we secretly have to tear down the tiles, put the moisture layer, and then tile again. And of course, this is how we sometimes build software. Um, when you hire someone to do this, you expect them to to do the sort of craftsmanship when they deem necessary. You have just prioritized the big bits, right? This actually worked until I talked to some teams in India. They don't do moisture protection in India. So they didn't know what I was talking about at all. So I have to find a different metaphor for this. But anyway, so. Let's go two directions. Let's go small first. What if you don't have time to do Scrum? If you work with companies in, in 
California, for instance, you work with companies, startup companies, they say, we can't do Scrum, it's too bureaucratic. We don't have time for sprints and this stuff. We need to be fast. We need to know if we can get money, the things we're doing. This is where you're trying to start up. How many of you have read their extreme book about the startup? Some of you did. It's inspiring read. As with most American books, you have to have a teacup full of salt beside you when you read it, because sometimes you have to th think about things and say, okay, this probably doesn't apply in our culture, but hey, it's an interesting concept. He looked at Lean, he looked at his problem that was startup companies, and he produced five very interesting things that you can guide guys, that you can follow to be efficient. One of them is stop asking if we can build a product, because we usually can. That's the wrong question. We should instead ask, should we build it? And can we build a sustainable business around the product? If we can, we build it. We find good engineers, we build it. Second thing they said was that failure is worth as much as success. We don't know always. Yeah, I agree. It's a marketing blah blah. Yeah, they say, what do you say? They say fail fast, fail often. It's not true. What we say is really we don't know everything about the market, so we better try. And if we're wrong, we better change fast. Actually, let's make it part of our work to be able to change. That makes it more powerful. So in this type of situation, you test things fairly quickly. And if it was a hit, you make a product out of it, or you make a, a proper feature out of it. If it was a fail, you pivot. You change the next thing. Okay, we, the thing we thought was good wasn't as good. We do the second best thing. Other thing that Lean Startup introduced that we can use, even in upper management, is the MVP, well, not the most valuable player, but minimum viable product. The least thing we can go to a market with without being embarrassed that we can test. So I usually take Google as an example. Before Google, there were kind of, you know, sucky search engines. Uh, we had the Yahoo tribe, we had Alta Vista and all of these things. These two guys, they looked at this and they said, what's the MVP for a search engine? It's a search box, right? And there's search results. Can we build a business around this? Sure we can. Let's make it. That's Lean Startup. Interesting thing, GE, General Electric, is going Lean Startup on all of the, their software efforts now. That's a huge organization. But they realize that they've been so slow over the years that they've been chewed up by their competitors. So you can do this even if you're big. The other way around, and uh, I wouldn't say that safe is bloated or, or fat in any way. I'm not suggesting that. Maybe I'm suggesting that it's sort of the new kid on the block, right? The thing about scaled agile framework or safe that is interesting is that it's it's a way to target big American corporations and turn them to agile. And I think this may be the first effort that can actually succeed because it talks to all of the stakeholders, it talks to the board members, it talks to the portfolio owners. It basically gives us, again, a framework to build priorities and create an environment where teams can self-organize around the problems and solve them, which I find really interesting. Say basically says, says, no matter the size of the organization, we only need three layers. We need a portfolio layer, we need a program layer, and we need a team layer. Now, the team layer does scrum, so we don't have to bother about them. They already know how to do this. The problem is that the managers up top, they don't. So they need Kanban rules. They need a portfolio government system uh, with Kanban, and they need release trains. Release trains, you say, well, we throw out projects. So I say we do no projects. We do constant rolling releases. And if your stuff is deemed worthy to be in a release, you're on the train, otherwise you're not. And you can budget from the number of trains you're running your guard. Okay, this is starting to get interesting because there's a new role here that's called a release train engineer. The release train engineer is like a, the, the old classic configuration manager, but with superpowers that are now sort of like a super scrum monster that pulls stuff together to make 
this really great work in practice. This is really interesting. It's a new role for organizations. Remember, think big. This is not for small companies. If you start doing safe and you're a small company, you will lose. It's too big for you. This is for really big organizations to understand. It also answers another question that's been a big problem. It's, it's about starting to be professional about the way you, again, prioritize things. It's usually a lot of fighting in organizations and product management on when are we doing this? When are we re refactoring this piece of code so it actually scales? How, when can we go to this market? Why do we need to upgrade these servers? Why do we need to do X, Y, Z? And uh, usually there's only features, 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 and we don't get enough done. Safe actually maintains two backlogs. One backlog for infrastructure and technical stuff, and one for business feature. All of the technical stuff that doesn't have an obvious business value is tied to business features. If we want to do these three things, we need to spend the best time to do this thing properly. It's a budgeting. And it's, it's actually answering a lot of questions that stakeholders used to have that they didn't get a proper answer for. Why do you need to do this stuff? Now finally there's an outlet to do it, which is good. By the way, the thing I'm doing with your friends at Seamless, for instance, is a scale down model of this that I created, which uses a, on the top level a model from Scania, balanced in capacity, and a technical level where teams plan forecast and work constantly on a rolling month, rolling quarter, and then we do scrum on the bottom. So about balancing capacity and making capacity understandable for the people trying to push things on us so they stop. That's really the key issue here. So finally, uh, I want to round this off out by saying there's one thing we, we forgot. There's one thing we left behind. This. And that is actually the people. And all of these frameworks, no matter what you call them, are created to allow for people to have the freedom of choosing a sequence of things to do and maintaining the capacity, meaning trying to be as efficient and productive as possible without management interfering too much. Management should be there to support us to a proper engineering job not pushing things until we stop being productive. I mean, look at Toyota. They got this 50 years ago. Toyota says that the two most important things when going in is relentless learning from everything we do and respect for people, respect for your co-workers, respect for your customers. These are the two th things I never see in lean implementations. I see a lot of whiteboards and colored magnets and sticky notes and a lot of kite send me things and stuff, they don't really know what they are. But I don't see respect for each other, and I definitely, definitely don't see relentless content learning because there's not time. So these are really important that we have to learn. These are people that understood that you can't just improve the engineering or software department, you have to improve the entire organization and take the whole picture. You have to create solutions that are scalable, accessible to everyone and sell people. Constantly, because otherwise it will become a paper problem, right? It will be a fun process that the HR coach created and no one reads it and he moves on. And that is not as interesting as actually trying to change the industry. So, all of the frameworks, visual boards, and stuff, they are there to drive a behavior. And if the behavior doesn't change in people, we have to change the methods. It's simple as that. And we tend to forget that sometimes. Less gut feeling. Less energy, actually. More structure. More teamwork. Less energy. There you go. So this is the first meeting at town, and uh, I don't know the format. I guess it's beer and questions and roasting.